Stormy Daniels says Donald Trump's sexual apparatus looks like Toadstool from the video game Mario Kart. For those of you who've never played Mario Kart or had sex with the president, Toadstool is a smiling mushroom with red spots on his cap. And of course, it makes sense that he's smiling if he's having sex with a porn star, though the red spots may be indicative of a serious venereal disease. This important story broke around the same time as a former writer for Sesame Street announced that famous Muppet pals Bert and Ernie are gay. This is also an important story because it's essential that children who are learning letters and numbers from the Muppets should simultaneously be able to imagine them committing sodomy. Otherwise, they might just go about their business being children while neglecting to affirm the lifestyles of people who feel bad about themselves. Muppet master Frank Oz, who created Bert, says that rumors of Bert's homosexuality are untrue. Oz, who also created the character Yoda in Star Wars, told reporters, quote, Bert and Ernie gay or not, puppets they are, don't an idiot be, unquote. Now, many of you may be thinking, why do celebrities need to ruin our innocent pleasures by connecting them to their wayward sex lives? Do we really have to watch Bugs Bunny and think about how his two ears remind us of a pair of lesbians engaging in unspeakable acts? Or am I the only one who does that? Okay, never mind. Forget I mentioned that one. Let's move on. <clears throat> My point is, why are the graphic details of celebrity sex lives news? Do they lower our taxes or keep us out of war? Of course not. This is just a case of oversized egos with undersized talents trying to force the toadstools of their self-involved libidos into the damp, dark recesses of our consciousness. Next thing we know, we'll all be thinking about how the way Mickey Mouse's head looks like the naked torso of a shapely woman. I, again, maybe that's just me. Never mind. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky-dunky-dee-doo. Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is zippity-zing. It's a wonderful day, hooray, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. All right. Hooray, hurrah. This is it. The Clavenless Weekend is upon us. You know, actually, this was kind of a long week. We had all the Blaze people here. There's so much going on. We're doing so many different shows that it really does feel like two weeks have gone by. But nothing, nothing can stop the Clavenless Weekend from coming at last. So hang on. Although, you know, I think I'm, oh, that's probably a tape. So I'm doing Ben's show, but I don't know if that's live or not. Is it? Uh, who knows? Uh, well, we're taping it, but it's going to be live two hours. All right, so I'll, they'll still, there's still a little bit of Claveny goodness to be gotten over on Fox <laughs> News and Ben's new show. Uh, today, we have a long and fascinating interview with Glenn Beck, who I don't have to tell you about. And I know that many of you hate Glenn Beck, and I know that because you keep telling me that you hate Glenn Beck. And uh, I'll, I'll put up a thing saying, you know, gee, he's what a talented guy is. And, oh, here is a traitor. Glenn Beck is a traitor. And I'm going to talk about that before I run the interview. I'm going to talk about your hatred and why uh, I think you should listen to the interview. We're going to stay on, right? We're going to stay on and let everybody hear it. Uh, all the more reason for you out of guilt to just come over to thedailywire.com and subscribe because you're getting all this incredible goodness for free. So go on over there. It's only 10 bucks a month. It's a lousy 10 bucks and a hundred bucks. You get the whole year and you get the leftist tears tumbler and uh, you can be in the mailbag. So all your questions will be answered. That was, that was a really good mailbag last time. So I enjoyed that. Robinhood, we have a new sponsor. This is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos all commission free. Now we gave this to Caitlin out and Caitlin and Katie kind of run the place and they were out there. So we let them play with it. I, I don't know how they're doing, but I hear a lot of giggling going on out there. So I think they're doing pretty well. And the thing is, that, you know, there's no commission fees, fees. Other brokerages charge up to 10 bucks for every trade, but Robinhood doesn't charge commission fees, trade stocks and keep all of you. You can trade stocks and keep all of your profits. It's easy to understand charts and market data. Place a trade. You can place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. Robinhood web platform also lets you view stock collections. You can just learn how to do this. I mean, it really is a good thing to learn how to do, and you can learn it right on the app. Robinhood is giving my listeners a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your port portfolio. Sign up at claven.robinhood.com. That's claven.robinhood.com. You can learn all kinds of things, like how to spell claven. It's K-L-A-V-A-N, no E's. In Claven, though I make it, I do make it look so easy, don't I? I know, but there's no ease. So, 
Uh, so listen, we haven't reached the end of the Kavanaugh story. There's still a lot of stuff up in the air, whether there'll be testimony on Monday or not, whether there'll be a hearing. But the one thing I think we can say beyond a shadow of a doubt is the Democrats in their slimy, despicable way, and really one of the worst incidences I've ever seen of this, have accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. I mean, the political calculus goes kind of like this. If Kavanaugh isn't appointed, if he's, if he's not appointed, it might just inspire conservatives to show up during the midterm election. So it might not actually be that good if they actually killed his appointment. The positive part of it is if they delay the vote, if they delay the vote, then they might take back the Senate and be able to stop it. And that means that the uh, Democrat senators running in red states won't have to cast a controversial vote just before. So there's a lot of you know calculus going on. But the one thing that can happen now that I think that the Democrats is really what they want is if he is uh, appointed, if he is confirmed to the Supreme Court, they will forever after have tarred this guy's name with a completely unprovable, unfalsifiable, unverifiable charge from 35, 36 years ago from when he was a teenager. There's no, I mean, all we do is we're sitting around and we're saying, oh, you know, did he do it? If he did do it, is it really that bad? Do we forgive him? Is there a great, why are we even talking about that when the entire thing is politics? It is all politics. This is a genuinely despicable thing. And all they want is to put this guy on the, if this guy gets on the Supreme Court forever after, they, they have put this completely, utterly, entirely unfair asterisk by his name, the way they have with Clarence Thomas, completely unfairly, so that anything he does, any decision he makes, they have tarred this good man's name. It really is despicable. I, again, this is not an attack on the accuser. She may have a false memory. She may not have a false memory. I have no idea. The point is, there is no way to know. And if there is no way to know, you're a senator, right? You're a senator of the United States. If there's no way to know, you do not bring it up. It is just not right. If there were a hundred women out there all saying the same thing, I'd feel a little bit differently about this. I would feel differently about this. Although you can always collect a hundred people who are willing to, to lie about somebody. But still, all this talk about, oh, you know, uh, I believe her. She looks honest. She seems honest. I don't care. I don't care. There's no way to prove it. Plenty of people can look credible. I don't know anything about her. I mean, everything people say, nobody has said anything nasty about her. I don't mean to say anything nasty about her. I just don't know. And so it is therefore inherently wrong to do this to a person. And just, you know, I, I want to start by playing a clip of Joy Behar. So like you want to might want to put something in your ears uh, just to keep it down a little bit. But I want to play this only because I would not play this if I just thought it was her. It was just awful Joy Behar. But I think this is representative of the entire Democrat Party and the left in general. First, just play her attacking Kavanaugh just to show you the way they're treating this guy at this point is cut four. These people in Congress right now, in that Senate Judiciary Committee, these white men, old, by the way, mm -hmm. are not protecting women. They're yeah. protecting a man who is probably guilty. If you're not uh, Judge Kavanaugh, take the lie detector test. Yeah. Prove it the way she did and the way Anita Hill did, that they were not lying. Let's see that from you. And the, or are you a coward? Yeah. Uh, by the way, just so you know, being old or white or male is not a bad thing. I'm all three and she can go to hell, you know, just to say this. But let's go back to 2016. This is two years ago. This isn't back in the Clinton era. This is two years ago when Hillary Clinton was, was running. Listen to what she said then. Teddy Kennedy. Remember Chappaquiddick? Am I the oldest, oldest person in no, the room? No, I remember okay. that. Chappaquiddick. I mean, <laughs> he, a girl drowns and he abandons her and, and he drowned. And pe women still voted for Teddy Kennedy. Why? True. Because he voted for women's rights. That's why. That's the bottom line of it, in my opinion. I mean, I don't like either one of them, to tell you the truth. Teddy or Bill. But they're both dogs, as far as I'm concerned. But I still will vote for Bill Clinton because yeah. he votes in my favor. So, so we know, but that's all of them. That is all of them. That is Dianne Feinstein. That is every single one of the Democrats and the left and all the people on Twitter posing their, with their feminist poses. They're all the same way. It is just about the power. It is just about the decisions. There was Joy Behar. That is as brash, as brilliant, uh, brilliantly painted, as bright a picture of hypocrisy as you were ever going to see, but it's all of them. I, I, say, I say this to you with a straight face, and I mean it. 
Every one of them is Joy Behar in, in this case. So let's just bring this up to date. Uh, Chuck Grassley, the uh, head of the Senate uh, committee that is um, that is the confirmation committee that is uh, t talking to, to Kavanaugh and deciding whether to pass it on to the full Senate. He has now gotten down, gotten tough and said, you know, she won't. They invited her to come and testify. She said she should testify. And all the left said was, we have to hear her out. We have to hear her out. So they said, come in on Monday. Is it <coughs> you can't hear her out? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? You, you can't do that. So uh, Grassley has now said that she's got to get in her. He, he really sent a tough letter uh, saying, you know, this is the but the latest and most serious of the Democrat side's abuse of the confirmation process. There has been delay and obstruction of this process at every turn and with every argument available. Therefore, I will view any additional complaints about the process very skeptically. And he gave her till Friday to get her prepared testimony in, or they will hold the vote on Wednesday. And here is uh, Senator uh, Gillenbrand, react, Christ, Kirsten Gillenbrand, who was a big Clinton supporters so are like, she has nothing to say about this, but she's now, now she's a big Me Too supporter because that's the way the wind is blowing. Uh, this is her responding to this. I don't think she should be bullied into this scenario where it's a he said, she said, uh, where many members of the committee have already made up their minds without the benefit of an FBI uh, investigation where it's um, nonpartisan and objective and without the benefit of corroborating witnesses being able to testify. It's a sham hearing. And I, I don't think she should participate in it. But it can only be he said, she said. This is why all of this is bogus, right? It's all bogus. It can only be he said, she said. 36 years later, when the accuser says she doesn't remember the day, she doesn't remember the place, what are the FBI, what questions are gonna, the FBI going to ask? You know, 35 years ago, did you go to a party? 36 years ago, were you a teen at a party that I'm not sure where or when that something may have happened? We don't know what. You know, I, what, what, how can you investigate that? The FBI refused to investigate because it's uninvestigatable. It is uninvestigatable. And the Senate has its own investigators who are put there. All of this is about one thing. It is all about one thing. It is making sure that if you don't toe the leftist line, you have to be afraid because they do not believe in diversity of thought. They do not believe that there could be another side. It is their side and hatefulness. And this is what I want to use this as an introduction to this interview with Glenn Beck, because it's a long interview, so I want to get to it quickly. I want to talk about our sense of diversity and our sense of individuality, because Donald Trump, obviously a divisive figure, both Glenn and I started out, Glenn Beck and I started out thinking, you know, this is a horrible, horrible guy. Both of us, I said when he was elected, all right, now he starts to work for me. I'm, I'm erasing the slate. Nothing happened before this. Now he's working for me. I will, um, I, I will make the judgments on what he does. I feel that Trump has done a great job. I feel that he's learned. I feel he's become better at what he's doing. For instance, during this Kavanaugh thing, he's been very restrained. That's something I don't think he would have had the wisdom to do before. He didn't just become a pugilist. He's kept, he's held his fire. I think he's gotten better. Glenn likes him a lot less than I do. I still feel that Trump is a, as a human being is not somebody I'm that thrilled about. But I'm an artist. I understand that the hands that sculpted the thinker also beat women. That's, life is complicated. I would not give up the, the brilliant sculpture of Rodin because he wasn't a great guy. I think Trump is doing a great job as president. I don't want him for a daddy. I don't want him for a friend. I don't want him anywhere near my daughter, but I think he's doing a great job as president. Glenn still has very, very serious reservations. Here is the thing, though. We stand, what do we stand for? What do we stand for? Never mind standing against the left. We stand for the rights of the individual. That's why we hate socialism, because we stand for you to keep your own money. We stand for the rights of the individual. We stand for diversity of thought. We stand for diversity of ideas and conscience because that's what individuals are made of. They're not made of whether you're gay or black or white. None of that is all that important. What is really important is your conscience and your thought and the way you reason about the world, this inner you that is you, that is the person that you are. If we believe in the individual, then we have to believe in disagreement. We have to believe that people of good conscience of good conscience are still going to disagree. They're going to find different ways forward. Glenn is not hating on Donald Trump because he has some plot to hand America over to the communists. He's examining his own conscience and what he wants to, what he what he wants for the country. So he's written this new book called Addicted to Outrage, which I think is, first of all, the premise of it is brilliant. It is addicted to outrage, how thinking like a recovering addict can heal the country. And outrage, I've said, how many times have I said 
anger is the devil's cocaine, right? Anger is the devil's cocaine. He's absolutely right that outrage is an addiction. And he wants to talk about uh, how to break that addiction and maybe move forward. I raised in this interview, I don't do a lot of talking in this interview because Glenn <laughs> can talk for himself, but I'm going to talk now. I raised two objections. He wants to bring those people together who will talk to one another. And I raised two objections. One is this. I feel that the worst, by far, by far, the worst behavior has been on the left. Are there bad people on the right? Obviously, of course there are. But our crazies, our crazies are in the comment sections of blogs. Their crazies are Diane Feinstein. Their crazies are senators and congresswomen and the last president of the United States. Their radicals, their radicals own the press. Their radicals own NBC, ABC, CBS. Their radicals control a media which universally attacks the basic standards of this country every single day and night. And so how do we reconcile, how do we get around that incredible structure of wrongdoing to get to the people on the left, and there are millions of them, how do we get to the people on the left who will talk to us, who will say, you know, you, you know what, you're not hateful. We do have points in common, a lot of points in common. I, too, think there are only two sexes. I think when they, you know, I, I want, you know, gay people to be treated well, but obviously there are only two sexes, men and women. How do we reach those people? So, you know, you'll hear me raise that objection to Glenn. And the other is, how do we get our own side to listen? When you're calling Glenn Beck a traitor, which let me tell you, is absurd. And I, you know, I, I really, I'm very fond of Glenn. I'd be, I'll be honest, obviously. It's, you can see how, that I'm fond of him when I talk to him. I also worked for him for six months and I saw the people he worked for and how much they loved him, how well they were treated. I mean, it's kind of hard not to like the guy. I also think he's one of the great broadcasters of the age, one of the natural talents of the age. So I have a lot of respect and affection for him, but, but I, I don't agree with him on, on some of this stuff. And I think there are problems about it that have to be faced. But is that, does that make him a traitor? He's a traitor? Really? Really? Because he thought Donald Trump was a bad guy? I mean, really? So I think it's worth listening to. It's well worth listening to. It's a really interesting interview. And I think just, you know, it's our, this is our side. There's got to be, remember what Paul said about the body of Christ. He said there are different people with different roles. What Glenn is thinking here, I think, is visionary. I think he has a view of the future that's really important. And I think it's worth listening to for all its problems. Here is Glenn Beck, one of the great broadcasters of the age, talking about his new book, Addicted to Outrage. Glenn, it's great to talk to you. Without, great to talk to you. And without a cigar, you know? I know, <laughs> I know. It doesn't smell in yeah. here. <laughs> I'll do what I can. Yeah, but. I know. Well, it smells a little because you're next door to Michael Knowles, so it <laughs> smells a little in here. He may be decaying <laughs> yeah, in there. I'm yeah, not right, sure. Right, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I've actually been really looking forward to this, not just because I always like talking to you, but you are actually writing and thinking about something that has kind of been obsessing me, but I want to talk to you about it in very realistic terms. We're talking about your book, Addicted to Outrage. So let's, we'll start there. We'll start with, talk about it. You're talking about outrage as an addiction, as an actual addiction. It is an addiction. And it, it um, why don't you hand it to me for a second? Um, I think it's on like page, I don't know, 11 or 22. It's one of those, you know, double numbers. Uh, it's, uh, it, here it is. Um, why Outrage Works. In the very beginning of the book, I, I talk about there are three um, things that are really important with, with the kind of outrage we're dealing with. First, the outrage that signals virtue. And the louder you get and the earlier you are, you are on this, the bigger you are, okay? And you, you can now really wield a lot of power because you were leading the way, okay? Then there's the next. This causes outrage to become a shield from any moral judgment on you because you now are, are untouchable. You can't, nobody can say anything about you. You, excuse me, you're talking about me? No, we're talking about that young girl that was whatever, ripped from the arms of her parents, <laughs> you know, uh, on the border. You now can shape everything. And the last piece is outrage as a weapon you have the three arrows in your quiver. You have shame, guilt, and fear. I can do anything to you. You cannot defend yourself. Now, I think we'd all recognize, I mean, it goes into a little deeper than this, but we can all recognize that that's what's happening right now. It's a weapon. That's all it is, is a weapon. But listen to this part. So now the last is it turns into identity. So outrage is an identity. 
By far the far most destructive as uh, aspect of outrage addiction is that over time it overtakes and replace, replaces the addict's identity. They surrender the responsibility of developing a caring, rational, human persona. Hallmarks of a genuine and healthy human personality tend to be smothered below a facade of impulsive, manic, emotional responses driven by the addiction. So it, in the end, it creates these shallow people that don't actually care. And let me give you an example, the border. Drew, I was there on the border in 2012. I was one of the only people on the border in 2012, remember, right? Yeah. Everybody in America hated me on both sides for this. But I felt we, we have to care about the people. I want them to go home. I'm not welcoming in. I want to make sure they're well fed and taken care of. So I go down there and, and the border guards are begging me, can you get the press to pay attention? They're separating these children, not from their parents. They were coming over in droves as children, okay? So like three kids would come in. One would be 15, one would be 10, one would be seven, but they were brothers and sisters. The border guards are like, we're putting all the 10 year olds in this shed. We're putting all of the seven year olds over here. We're separating them. It's tearing these children apart because they came with their brother and sister and they have no security now. Can you please get somebody to pay attention? I begged the media. I called them, I wrote them. Look, you don't have to include me. This is really important. Nothing, right. nothing, because they've become this empty shell, a rotting corpse with a giant shield and arrows that's just signaling virtue, but it's all for politics. Well, there's, there's nothing real. Okay, so this is the thing, because obviously this is a problem in our country, right? We're totally divided. Right. Think, things are going great in the country. I, I mean, I laugh about it all the time for somebody who loves the absurd. Yeah. Things are really pretty good, you know? Not, not only here in the country, but capitalism, and I outline this yeah. in the book, it, there's no better time to live than right now. Absolutely. And if you, if you could choose where you were going to be born and raised, it would be right now in America. I'm with you 100%. Yeah. I mean, and, and when you compare it to the way life can be, yeah. which is really bad, it's amazing. It right. is amazing. Okay. So, I mean, I say this on the show all the time. I have a slogan, anger is the devil's cocaine. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's it the is. devil's yeah. cocaine because it, you know, makes you feel righteous. But the people that you're talking about, and here's one of the first two things I just, because I want to be realistic about this. The, one of the first two things, all the people that you're talking about are on one side of the political divide. Not saying there are no jerks on the right. I'm just saying as a philosophical, as a, as a philosophical point, that the people who are ignoring the people in the border in 2012 and making a crisis out of it in 2018 are doing it because they're on the left. You weren't on the border with me and got the, the massive body blows from my friends on the right. Okay? Right. So... Um, generally speaking, I agree with you. I'm not talking about the quality of the people, though. I'm talking about this massive pre media, which is so okay, powerful. Okay, so yeah. let's so let's separate things. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about this plan, because this is not a this is not a hey, we all have to love each other book. Okay. This is not surrender. This is you don't understand what's being played and how they're playing it, and why they're playing it, okay? And most Democrats don't even know it. But once you understand the game they're playing, your outrage, your hitting back, your response, your anger is only making it go faster. They want that from you, okay? Hmm. So if you, if you want to save the country, you need to reframe. We're doing the same thing over and over, and it's just getting worse. That's insanity. Why is it getting worse? Because we don't understand the game that the ultra left is playing. And they would say the ultra right, but I would put the ultra right with the ultra left. Yeah, there are okay? only 20 of them, the yeah. ultra right. Yeah. All right. So with that being said, we have to first let's 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 define the playing field here. Let me be really pessimistic. I do not think it's anywhere close to this, but let me be really pessimistic. Think of a football field, right and left, okay? Let's say there is 15% of radicals. 
who want to destroy America on the left. Okay, and on the right. There's another 15% that、sure. mm-hmm. just want to rip us apart. They want nothing to burn it all down. We're going to start all over again. Whatever it is, whatever it is, they hate what we have. Okay, that's 30%. Nothing in this book is aimed towards them. You're not going to change them. They're not going to. They're not going to、um, be saved or turned around. They do not have good intentions. I'm talking about the 70 percent. Now, out of that 70, I'll bet you that there are 60 that are gettable.、Mm-hmm. It only no, takes, I actually agree with these numbers. Right, these, okay. These are, yeah. It only takes 20 percent, 17 percent for the tipping point. A dedicated 10 percent can change the world. 17 percent is a tipping point. You have 50 percent that are lockstep that that say, "I know the game you're playing." I know the game you're playing, and you know what? Doesn't bother me.、Mm-hmm. Doesn't bother me. Here, here's here's what we are going to do. We're going to do X, Y, and Z because this large group of people are talking to each other. We know who we are. You're lying to us and about us. Okay, you are maybe you're on the left. You on the left, these radicals are lying to me about them. And those on the right, okay, okay, But, we're we're all being lied to, and we're I, being used I, and listen, manipulated. I, I am with you, and I, when I, I watch you say these things, and I want—I mean, just today, I, I sent out a tweet because we did that、uh, backstage show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was I. I hate to flatter you, but I, I can't help it. I was marveling at your broadcast. You are a broadcast god. I've never seen anybody walk into a room and and, well, and, and speak as naturally you, I, as that. Take my shirt off. I look a little it, like Thor. I know. We, we、yeah. were dazzled. I was yeah, blind, I I was blinded, blinded by the beauty. I know. I know. <laughs> but I, I, I said something on Twitter, and immediately I got Beck as a traitor. Beck, he's a traitor. I thought like Glenn Beck is a traitor because he had reservations about Trump. You've been really fair to him. I mean, you you did not like you haven't just sat there taking pot shots at him, and you haven't been like some people who I find kind of annoying who are still kind of virtue signaling over Trump's many many personal flaws.、Mm-hmm. Uh, but you've kind of you've given him a fair. You know, I said I would. Like, yeah, I yeah, said I would during the election. I said, look. I'm judging him based on what I know of him now. The real judge starts once he becomes That, president. That's what I said too. But like, but what I want to ask you is,、yeah. as a business matter, right? Because we're in a, this is a business. I mean,、yeah. this is a business. As a business matter, how then do you break through your persona it, I don't to、know. the people? I don't know. Okay. I don't know.、Um, I, I can't. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I talked to. You ever read the book Pendulum? No. Okay, so business book came out about 2011. <coughs> An absolute must read. You should read it. Have you、okay. read the Fourth Turning? No, these are you, you okay, read books two, that you know come out of my can. I'll go、okay. look for them. Yeah. yeah, you should read both of those、okay. books because it will help you. I've been I've been reading stuff that's that will help me explain what's happening to us,、okay. where we are in history, the patterns of history are really important. Who has done these things before?、Mm-hmm. How did it go wrong? How did it go right? Let me start with、uh, Gandhi. Why did Gandhi win? Because he was up against a, a nation with a conscience that would actually respond to his tactics. Correct.、Yeah. Why did Bonhoeffer lose? Because he wasn't. He was up against monsters. Okay. Right.、Yeah. So the 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 it, very good, <laughs> Drew. I, I've asked that question so many people, and they don't. They, I, well, I don't really know. <laughs> It's clear. Bonhoeffer was saying to the people around him, "I've got to talk to Mr. Gandhi. He knows how to fix this." Okay.、Mm-hmm. He didn't have any special, you know, magic that he could do. Bonhoeffer was doing it. The difference was the people. They had lost the Judeo-Christian principles.、Yeah. They had gone dark. They had begun to、um, accuse each other, hate each other. Separate into other camps and become cowards. It was too late. It was too late. It's not too late for us. No, it's, it's not. not too late.、Right. It is growing late. <laughs> but I, I, I went over to Poland with my kids, and I met one of the righteous among the nations. She's a sweet, sweet woman who helped the Jews. Who helped the Jews? She saved a hundred Jews. She was sixteen. 
And um, a Jewish girl came up to her on the street and said, please, I'm starving. You could only feed a Jew, I think, 300 calories a day. Okay, so they were starving to death. If you were caught feeding or giving any kind of food to a Jewish person, not only would you uh, get their same fate, uh, but your whole family would. So Paulina is walking on the street, and this woman comes up to her and says, please, I'm starving. She said, I don't have any food, but meet me here tomorrow, and I'll bring you something. So now it's dinner time. She's sitting with her mother, her brother, and her father. And she says, Mom and Dad, I did something today. Now remember, you're in Nazi Germany, you're right. right on the wall of the ghetto. And they, the mom and dad, she said, the mom and dad just looked at each other. I said, what? She said, I met a Jewish girl. She was about my age and she asked me for food and I said I would bring it tomorrow. She told me that her mom and dad just stared at each other at the table for a while, didn't say anything, just stared at each other. You know, that conversation that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. And um, her mom shook her head and got up, got a pot, started peeling vegetables. And Paulina said, what are you doing? And she said, well, she's certainly not going to come home. She's certainly not going to come alone if she's starving. Everybody she knows is starving. It's a great story. Okay. Yeah. So they save a hundred. Um, so I go there and I'm with my family. This is a personal journey. I'm with my family. I bring my older kids and we go through Auschwitz. I make them read a story. I don't care who, but read the story of one of the righteous among the nations. And we get there right before we go in. And I said, this is the summer that we are going to decide who we are. Because when it happens, if you haven't prepared for it, you're gone. If you haven't exercised your moral muscle on the easy things, you're done. So we went. We met Paulina afterwards. And she told us the stories of what it was like. And I said to her, the last thing, everybody was leaving. And I said, Paulina, I have a big audience. And I, I feel like these days are coming back. And I said, and I believe everybody has the tree of righteousness in them. What do, how do I water it? She looked at me with just such a strange, like, I don't even understand that question. <laughs> and she said, you misunderstand. The righteous didn't suddenly become righteous. They just refuse to go over the cliff mm. with the rest of humanity. Mm. That's groundbreaking to me. You don't have to be Superman. You just have to stand where you've always stood, where your parents said, this is right, this is wrong. How many, how many genders are there? How many differences of the sexes? How many? Two. Two, Two. right? Yeah. You know that. Why yeah. do you know that? Because it's all nature reveals it. To right. You. Yeah. Nature reveals it. Science has right. proven it. That's yeah. it. Right. Don't go over the cliff with the rest of humanity. Because if you don't exercise your moral muscle on the little things that seem, you know, big now, you could lose your job for saying that. What happens? But see, I, you know, all of this, all of this I agree with. And the thing that that is that bothers me, because I really do believe you're right, we haven't gone too far. And I, and I don't think we're as far as you do. I'm always a little bit more optimistic. <laughs> right. anyway, but but I, I do think the direction we've gone is all toward the left. And so when I'm, when I'm with the, I always say that no, our, we, crazies, our crazies are in the comments section. Their crazies are in Congress. You know, and I think that that's, that, mm. is, that is something. I just talked to a Republican in, in one of the houses of Congress, who yeah. shall remain nameless, who said, Glenn, I don't know anyone. I can count them on two fingers. Beyond that, I don't know anyone in the GOP that actually truly believes in the Bill of Rights. Wow. Okay? Yeah. Um, whether that's true or not, yeah. for him to have that perception, yeah. that's pretty bad. That is bad. So um, I write off all the people in Washington. I've given <laughs> yeah. up on Washington. Yeah. Not going to change Washington. Washington is not a hopeful And Washington yeah. is, it will never lead. The people must lead. Washington will eventually wake up or they will just become irrelevant. Mm. Okay? Um, 
here, here's the thing. We are changing because we're angry and righteous anger. Okay. I, I, when people say to me, oh, you can't compare Barack Obama to Donald Trump. Oh, yes, I can. Yes, I can. You're saying he's a racist. Really? Can you help me again with Jeremiah Wright? Hmm. We're just ignoring things of our own camp. But okay. you went out, I used to watch your show all the time, and you would come out when you would explain the Constitution, you'd explain American yeah, history. Yeah, yeah. You were you were a hated figure on the right. I mean, you were saying you were speaking. But why? I, but, that's what I'm asking okay. you. Like, what, I was a, a hated figure on the you right. Were a, no, you were a hated figure on the uh, you were considered to be a right winger. Yes. A right winger for sitting there going, here's the Constitution, here's God, this is what we believe, these are the things we've always believed. So you became <laughs> right. Uh, that made you a but right winger. How and that makes many, me a right winger. I know, and, yeah. I know. <laughs> How many people got the truth because of the media right. and the giant organizations that are just trying to pit us against each other for money, for power? How many people actually watched me more than a segment with Jon Stewart? Mm. How, many people, how many people would be willing to sit down and say, I think this guy is a horrible human being, but I want to know myself. Hmm. Craig Hatkoff is a guy who he co-created uh, the Tribeca Film Festival. You think I'm popular with the Tribeca <laughs> Film Festival? Oh yeah, they have the big, okay. po the big right. Glenn posters. Right. Yeah, the, yeah. He called me one day and he said, "May I just meet you?" I said, "Sure." What, what do you want? What, what, what do you What do you want to do? And he said, "I just, I just want, I just want to meet you. I just want to talk to you." We went into a very liberal restaurant where he was very popular and I was not. We are good friends mm. because he didn't, he wanted to know himself. This is what I think you are based on what everybody tells me, but it doesn't make sense to me. I don't think you're that guy. Mm. He ended up, now think about how unpopular this, this is. He's the guy who nominated me and I won a Tribeca Film Festival award. Okay. Yeah. That didn't happen. Right. It just requires us to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to listen to the noise. I'm not going to listen to the noise because I don't believe 50% of the country wants to destroy us, whichever side that is. I do believe 30% of the country, 15 and I'm being generous. I just say 30. I don't know how it's balanced, but just let's say 15 and 15. I do believe there is 30% of this country, and I think this is too big of a number, that do want to destroy us. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, so then why are we letting that 30% control us? And we're losing reason. When, when that person said, you know, oh, I hate Glenn Beck, Twitter. Don't I know it, brother? <laughs> yeah, Don't no, I, I know I, it? I know. I okay? Know. Yeah. It was interesting to me. I did a podcast with somebody a couple of days ago, and the, all the things were Glenn Beck, oh, Glenn Beck, Glenn Beck, Glenn Beck. One of them, because in it I had said that uh, we were talking about Anonymous, and I said, look, the problem is he's the president. He's the duly elected president of the United States. The people selected him. We Decided, we voted him into office. My point being, you cannot go around the people. No cabinet, no, nobody, nobody. That, anybody who's taken stuff off of the president's desk and he's like, where is that stuff? You should not be around the president because he has my power. He has your power. Yes, Mike, he has Barack right. Obama and all the people who voted for Barack Obama. He has their power too in a government way, okay? He is supposed to be our president. But so many people on the right said, oh, he's our president. You said he was going to be a disaster. You're now claiming victory for him. No, no, that's not what I was doing. I'm very clear on where I stand, what I like and what I don't. Take it or leave it. It's my opinion. You don't have to march in lockstep. I'm not asking anybody. Right. In fact, I'm encouraging you not to walk in lockstep with me or anybody else. Do your own homework. Be your own person. 
surround yourself with people who challenge your point of view so you are strong enough to defend it and you know what's real. Conservatives have a great advantage over liberals. We are, we are pushed to the wall almost every day since, since you've said, I'm a conservative. Your life is a he- <laughs> just hell, okay? We're pushed to the wall. We're called bigot, racist, homophobes. At some point, you have to say, am I one of those? Am I? Is this view point? You have to do the thinking or you're just, I don't know what you are, but you're not a human being if people are calling you that all the time and it doesn't make you stop and think. So we have to think who we really are, why we believe these things, because it's so much easier to just give up and go to the left. It's just easy. Yeah. Yeah, I got a million other questions, but I'm out of time. I, I, mean, oh I think I think you're the, so the I think you're talking about a, a visionary path, and I actually think it's possible. This is as optimistic as I've ever heard you sound. So there must be me getting on your nerves. Or something. I was really <laughs> no, no, no. I will tell you, Andrew. I was really, I was depressed four years ago. Mm. I didn't see a way out. Yeah. Um, and I, my gut told me this is the way to go, but I didn't understand it. I did research. I found out what the disease actually is. What Who's doing this to us? Where are these words that none of us have ever heard of come from? Once you understand that, now let's fight differently. Yeah. Don't I, surrender. Fight differently. Well, I want you to know when they come to get you, I'm going to be the guy like Peter going, I never saw him before. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I hated him. They made me say that about him <laughs> exactly. on the show. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, it's great to see you always. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, Glenn Beck, I, the guy, I think he's on a visionary path and he's going to pay a price for it. And then when he does, we'll all desert him. I think that's uh, basically the way to go. All right, stuff I like. Stuff I like. Stuff I like. Stuff I like. Stop, stop, stop. Stuff I like. Stuff I like. Stuff I like. Stop, stop, stop. All right, that was Matt Zwerkowski. Uh Matt, keep your day job. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Let's talk about sex. Uh, You know, it's since it's all the news. Uh, I I had this funny thought as I was driving home yesterday. I was thinking, you know, you know, if people restricted their sex lives to marriage, like all these problems would go away. All these Me Too things would go away. I thought, well, how come no one's ever thought of that before? And of course, I realized that what the left is complaining about, what the left is complaining about is the blowback from their own culture. They're the ones who told us that marriage didn't matter. They're the ones who told us to be free. They're the ones who told us that women love sex just as much as men. And now they're the ones complaining about how they get treated when you tear the fence down, when you tear the wall down. Who was it who said, don't tear down the wall until you know what's behind it? What's behind it is sex, which is an unruly, passionate, difficult, complex system, human system that was not built for civilization, right? It wasn't built to make civilization. It makes civilization arises out of it, but it is a troubling, uh, disturbing process that, that, that keeps civilization on its toes for sure. I was thinking back in the day when a woman's uh, virginity was of value, uh, as some of us still think it is, but back in the day when a woman's, uh, when it's all society thought a woman's uh, virginity was of value, the idea was to talk her out of it. The idea was to seduce her, right? And if you couldn't seduce her, uh, you might wind up marrying her. You know, I mean, that was basically the kind of, you know, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said that a, a castle, neither a castle nor a woman's virginity can stand once they begin to parlay, once they begin to talk. And this, this process of trying to overcome a woman's virtue, a woman's resistance created the art and the act of seduction, which has produced some of the greatest art uh, there ever was. And there, there are whole poems, there are whole uh, genres of poems that are just built on seduction. And I was thinking, you know, I pity kids coming up today in the sexual world that they're coming up with now, where all the sort of all the fun and all the uh, danger and all the um, uh, interplay between male and female are sort of stripped down to this kind of of legalistic matter. And you don't know whether 30 years from now, something that went a little bit wrong is going to come back and destroy your career. It really is ugly. So I wanted to revisit one of my favorite poems. This has been on Stuff I Like once before, about two years ago, but it's worth bringing back. And I didn't read the whole thing then. And I'm going to read the entire thing now. It's a 1681 poem, one of the most famous seduction poems ever, to remind you of what's at stake here. It's called To His Coy Mistress by Andrew Marvel, uh, who was uh, part of the, uh, when the 
king of England was overthrown. He was part of that. Uh, he wasn't a Puritan, though, and as you will hear. And here's, here's the logic of the poem, so you know what I'm reading, So you, in case you lose track of it. He says to the woman, if we had all the time in the world, it would be okay for you to be coy. It's called to his coy mistress, meaning she's not giving over. She's not sleeping with him. If we had all the time in the world, that would be fine. But we don't. We don't have all the time in the world. And he says, if we had all the time, I would do nothing but charm you through all eternity. I would not do nothing but charm you until you finally slept with me. But in fact, time runs out. Life is short. And after you're dead, if you die a virgin, then the worms will eat your virginity instead of, instead of your sharing it with me. So now, let, let us, let's do it. Let us do it. And what's so wonderful about this poem is it basically reminds us that sex is part of the life drive. There's something essential about it, and it's unruly, and it doesn't work. Our, our sexual feelings don't work. There is no law that you can put in place that is ever going to make our sexual feelings and sexual actions bring it into league with civilization. It is always going to be a conflict between what men see, what women see, what people want, and just the urge to keep on going and love each other and stay alive and reproduce. So here is To His Coy Mistress, one of the great poems of all time by Andrew Marvel. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness, lady, were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou by the Indian Ganges' side shouldst rubies find, I by the tide of Humber would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love would grow vaster than empires and more slow, and hundred years should go to praise thine eyes and on thy forehead gaze. Two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest, at, at an age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For, lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. And yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vaults shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honor turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chap power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball and tear our pleasure with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our sons stand still, yet we will make him run. Sexy life, as it used to be. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Clavenless Weekend is upon us. Survivors gather here on Monday. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And our animations are by Cynthia Angulo and Jacob Jackson. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire forward publishing production. Copyright forward publishing 2018.